Today we're visiting with Susan and Ed Rohde in their St. Louis County suburban landscape. We'll be looking at some sunny spaces and a really large and really neat shady space in the backyard. So tell us about uh, your front yard. Well, um, when we moved in and before we got started with native plantings, it was mainly turf grass. And there was a small circular garden over there that was just hostas and non-native ornamental grasses. Uh, there were also hostas around the different trees. Well, over time we got rid of those. We planted natives in the little circle garden, but then in 2018 we extended it out. This has all been planted in uh, late summer 2018. Wow. Which so, is hard so, for me to believe. Yeah, I, just third growing season. Right. That's hard for me to believe it's gotten this big. I had to look back at my pictures to make sure I was right. And I didn't kill the grass. I killed the grass, but I didn't spray it. I we, took leaves from all these trees and just piled a foot of leaves in the fall and let them get matted down. And it basically killed the grass. And that first year I did have to, because it's zoysia grass, I did have to pull out some places where it grew up through the leaves. Well, and we had a few small uh, weeds, you know, but it, it wasn't too bad the first year. No, I, I thought it was going to be a nightmare trying to clear that much open space. And then we did have some crabgrass the first year to deal with. Just but, a little. But the next year, uh, the sun doesn't get to the ground, and so we really don't have much uh, issues with leaves or with uh, weeds. So, so what is that plant, Susan? This is an oxeye sunflower. Uh, the native bees love it. There's a native something right there. I don't know if it's a bee or a fly. I don't haven't learned all the differences yet. Uh, butterflies love it also. And this is a um, eastern blazing star, a fairly new one. No, no, sorry, it's bottle brush, bottle brush blazing star coming up there. There's New England aster behind that'll be blooming in a few weeks. Black-eyed Susans. Do you know which Rudbeckia by chance? No, these were a gift. Um, they originated up there by the fence and we moved them. So I'm not positive what that is. It'd be great to be able to figure it out, but I don't know if you can do that. We have two or three different versions of it uh, because the petals are different. The, the, the centers are not flat or they're mounded. Uh, and then the leaves, some of them are uh, rough and then some of them are smooth. So we have more than one variety. So this low plant here was uh, is uh, Lance Leaf Coreopsis. It bloomed in the spring, pretty yellow flowers. That is a, sh let's see, what are you focusing on now? Um, right there is a showy coneflower. I believe these that aren't blooming yet are orange, some version of orange coneflower. Uh, we put some purple coneflowers in front. Is this mist flower? It is mist flower, and it's uh, we planted three plants in the fall of 2018, and they pretty much uh, spread. There'll be really pretty purple flowers on it in a few weeks. I can see some are starting right now. Um, We'll probably have to send that out some and give some plants away to the neighbors and my family. Uh, we have purple poppy mallow here. This is the really pretty pink flowers. It's a good ground cover. Uh, looks a little wilted right now. It might need some water, although it does well in dry. There's some little clumps of June grass in there. There's one that did flower this spring and you can see the seeds. So, Ed, you were saying earlier that uh, this plant is new in this location? Yeah, this whole section here I'm in the process of planting because these plants here ended up being taller than I wanted, and so I wanted some shorter things in front on this slope, and I put uh, the purple poppy mallow in there, and it's, there's two plants that they have grown huge by comparison to any other and places just we planted it. Last year those were put in, right? Yes, yeah. last fall. And then this, this eyelash grass had been growing up near the fence, uh, and it never really did much. And so I moved it down here on the slope, uh, and it's three times the size of where it was uh, 
just left. 30 feet away. So is this then a, like a sunnier, drier space? Yes. Uh, well, certainly sunnier. I'm not sure whether it's drier or not. When um, it rains, I mean, obviously the rain comes down here, uh, but it looks pretty dry right now. But these, these have done, and there's two different versions of it, the eyelash grass, one is the hairy and one is the, the other one, uh, but they're both doing much better here. So you just have to move things around and 30 feet sometimes can make a huge difference. And also here in the prairie, Susan, you've got some really interesting and neat plants. So it looks like what, marsh milkweed here? Marsh milkweed just beginning to bloom and the taller purple flower is curly top ironweed. Boy, that's a tall one. Yes, it is very tall. <laughs> I think it got a little taller than the, the plant tag said it would, but I guess it likes where it's planted. Yeah, because that's what got to be nearly seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it'll be covered with purple blossoms. It's just now starting, and then the butterflies will it will be covering the top of it. I'm surprised. I, well, there was one flying around a little bit What's earlier. What's this grass? I don't know how well it's going to show up in the the footage it's here with the sun, but what's the grass? Switch grass. Yeah, it's hard to photograph the little seed. Yeah, it's a really pretty, and it's a very neat, plumy seed head there. Mm -hmm. And then behind it is the showy, go uh, showy cone flower. And it's probably been, this is probably its third year, and it is markedly bigger than it was last year by the three feet. The grass? Yes, oh, by for like sure. three feet. Because that's also, what, six or seven feet tall, mm -hmm. it looks like. And originally I was a little concerned about having tall plants in the middle of our front yard that used to just be lawn and our neighborhood is pretty much traditionally landscaped. But we have, we get favorable comments from neighbors as they walk by. Uh, I think because it's defined, it's a defined area that helps it to look like we mean for it to be here. Yeah, you're, I mean, you've got mowed turf grass all around your, your plant bed here. And then these are heart-leaved alexanders or golden alexanders. They bloomed in the spring. They'll have a bunch of seeds. Uh, the black, eastern black swallowtail uses it as a host plant. I don't see any on it right now, the caterpillars, but I have in the past. This is Texas green eyes. Oh yeah, we love Texas green yes. eyes. Uh, behind that, the yellow flower is a uh, rosin weed, right? Yeah. Yes. Rosin weed. Earlier we had some crown beard wing stem blooming, but the yellow flowers, uh, actually a lot of our flowers attract the American goldfinch birds, and they will fly, they eat the petals of some of the plants, and of course the seeds, when the seeds develop, there's a yellow butterfly of some sort. Um, we attract more goldfinches now with our plants than we do uh, with the bird feeders. Oh, I'm so happy to hear you say that. Yeah. Um, it's just amazing. Sometimes I'll come out here, especially when the lance leaf coreopsis was blooming, and even now with some of the seeds, I know sometimes I'll come out and there'll be like almost a dozen goldfinches out here at the same time on the coneflowers and all the different plants. And then when I come out, I scare them away accidentally and they all fly off together. It's just a cool sight. Well, and that's just a good quality reminder of another reason for doing the native plants and part of the gardening practices is leaving the spent flower heads, right? Well, yes, and last winter uh, was the first time, I think it was, uh, junco, I forget what they call it, in a dark-eyed junco. We had some some flower stalks we left up there by the fence, and in the winter they were covered with birds eating the seeds in a snowstorm. I took a video of that. It was pretty cool. I had never seen that before. The uh, goldfinch on the Coreopsis don't wait for the seeds to dry out. They eat the green seeds. And so we didn't have, as, this spring in particular, we did not have nearly as much trouble with uh, worrying about Coreopsis spreading everywhere because the goldfinch didn't let the seeds dry out. It just ate them before they were, while they were still green. Um, and then 
them, we just pruned them off. Very cool. So if I heard you right, the goldfinches are actually helping with your gardening. Yes. Oh yeah, they, they, <laughs> they ate the seeds before they had a chance to dry out and drop into the soil. Let it be noted to all the, the crazy bird people out there, one more reason to be putting native plants in your yard, right? Goldfinches yes. and the birds will help you with your gardening. I love they it. Sure do. This is, looks like rock pink uh, fame flower. Yes. This is, I've, we've never, never seen this in a garden before, although I, I, I guess I would sort of expect to see this kind of thing in the wild, but uh, how did you, how'd you make this happen? It was at one of the evening uh, wild ones meetings where you get to go to other people's houses and this one house had a whole bunch of this type of rock uh, that had it growing out of. Uh, and so I said, geez, I've got some of that rock. And so I just put sand in the holes and stuck some of the plants from another area of the backyard in the rock. And that's what came of it. It's a really pretty plant in the afternoon. It blooms in the afternoon and early evening. It doesn't bloom in the morning. Bright, bright purple pink flowers. Uh, self seeds. It's it's a, a semi annual, biennial kind of thing, um, but it just looks really really pretty in bloom. The stems are really thin, uh, and these flowers are just kind of standing out uh, in the middle of nowhere. So it's it's very attractive plant. So is this uh, uh, how old? What when when did you this spring? Put this spring you put the plant in the rock oh. yeah was it i yeah. thought it was last year it was last year sorry <laughs> no i put these in there most of those didn't come back and i planted them oh in there this okay spring. sorry i had had some in there last year too i thought they came back I excellent a couple came back the tiny ones very cool very cool we may have to try that ourselves so this is uh prairie pussy toes yeah, then field. susan we were just talking about um, yes it's also called field pussy toes and uh, it started out, I had three little plants here and it has spread and... Um, about two years. Right, these are about two years old and in the spring, early spring, it gets about six inch tall flower stalks with little white flowers. And um, the early native bees like those a lot. So it's a flowering ground cover, yes. spring bloomers. And then um, it is also a host plant for the American Painted Lady Butterfly. This is a serious ground cover. I mean. And it is, and what's interesting about that Painted Lady Caterpillar is it'll, it'll eat off of the leaves, but it doesn't eat the whole leaf. It doesn't like chew up the leaf. It'll scrape off the green part on top and it'll just leave a lot of white showing. I mean, this underside of the leaf looks white, so the top part will look like this underside when the caterpillar is eating, it just kind of moves along and scrapes off the green. And uh, I had the, I was lucky enough last year to see that in action. It was pretty cool. But this was an area that had a lot of weeds in it before we planted it, and it is pretty much suppressed uh, weeds. Uh, there's a few that pop up that you that are easy to pull out, but uh, it's a very low maintenance area once it fills in. Susan, this looks like partridge pea. Yes, it is. We saw a partridge pea uh, with Dan Pearson uh, some time back. Uh, of course, that was earlier in the season and his wasn't in full bloom yet. This looks glorious. Yes, it's really, really pretty when it's in full bloom. Attracts all the bees and busy with bees right now, so they tend to be in the back more. What inspired you to uh, add this particular plant? It's not a real popular plant. Well, I guess I heard about it um, when I looked at the Missouri Wildflowers Nursery Catalog, and we were just starting to get into native plants in 2016, and I placed an order with them to pick up at the Best of Missouri at Shaw, or, yeah, Shaw's Garden, or Botanical Garden, and I just started the seeds and you have to cold stratify them. I put them in the refrigerator, but I think I left them too long because they got moldy. I planted a few that still looked okay. One germinated, 
And uh, over time, that one plant seeded itself and we ended up with these. That's great. So all of this came from one plant that you could say sort of barely survived your stratification yeah. attempt. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So this is what, a few years old, five years um, old? Well, that was 2016, so that would have been spring of 2017 that I had the plant that got planted. Where did I plant that first? The first plant was planted over there in that spot. Okay. Now, I probably spread some of the seeds myself. I don't think they all migrated over here on their own. Sure. Some did. <laughs> we had some come up from the grass on their own over here. And what's the, what's the, we're here in the morning, um, so your house is shading this space right now, but does this get uh, midday sun? Yeah, it gets um, afternoon sun, like say maybe 1 p.m. through to about four or five, okay. then it starts to get shady again as the sun goes down because of all the trees over there. So it doesn't get full sun, really. I think it probably gets like four hours of direct sunlight and then um, dappled sunlight after that. Very cool. Well, very happy plants and, uh, and very, very happy bees too. All right, and so now we're here in your woodland garden, right? Yes. Lots of shade, lots of trees. Uh, let's talk about what you've got here and what you've been working on. Well, there was an area that was infested with uh, honeysuckle uh, that over a couple years has been removed for the most part. Tried to leave a little bit of the uh, screen effect uh, so the neighbors, you know, we weren't staring at each other. But it has been a, a major uh, undertaking and then trying to uh, leave the uh, violets and some of that stuff in this area as well. And right here we have American beet grain. I think I planted two plants here originally in the fall of 2017 and it's multiplied. I've even dug some up to give them away. Uh, I really like it especially in the evening when the sun comes from the other direction and it's coming through the seed heads that are drooping over it looks really pretty and it's been a good ground cover and what's over here this looks pretty interesting right here is um, elephant's foot it before the flower stalks come up it's just a low ground cover it really covers the ground well and then the flower stalks come up and they'll probably be blooming in another week or two. And it's a tiny little white lavenderish flower and it's just loaded with native bees, tiny little insects. Flies. Uh, yeah, flies, uh, little butterflies. It's loaded with them when the, the, it's in bloom. So, th so this, is, this is actually forming a pretty nice ground cover. Then. It is, yes. And it's easy to keep controlled. You can you know, you don't really want it to seed in area, and so we trim off the extra sun flowering. We trim off the stalks, um, and then in the spring it sprouts later than some of the early spring plants, so it's uh, easy to weed around, uh, uh, and you get it cleaned out so that it's just the, the plants we want to grow there. Very good, very good. So, uh, speaking of... Leaves. Speaking of shrubs then, um, and you mentioned the honeysuckle removal, uh, let's look at some of the larger plants you've installed. Uh, several Joe Pye weed, the standard Joe Pye weed, and then the hollow Joe Pye weed. And I, when he first planted the Joe Pye weed there, I thought it's not sunny enough for these to do well, but look. They've done really well and they're, they bloom and it, again, their blossoms have bees and the bigger bumblebees and then the smaller ones that are harder to show up, harder to see, but it's done well. We have goat's beard, white goat's beard there. Um, there's a couple mock oranges further on. We tried a pawpaw that's doing well. We didn't know what would do well back here because a lot of the plants said they needed a decent amount of sun to bloom. 
Uh, and which is true, like the spice bush, I think this spring was the first year they bloomed and they, it's their fourth year. Uh, but they're doing all right. And uh, let's see what else, oh, the fragrant sumac is over here. And uh, our elderberries. <laughs> oh, we love elderberry. Well, this, this one was the original plant in the first year I planted it, which again was probably 2017. It was just a tiny little $5 Missouri wildflowers plant. And something broke it off, broke the top of it off when it was growing. And I thought for sure it was a goner. Well, look here, it bloomed really nicely this spring or earlier this summer. And now it's loaded with elderberries. So you're saying these plants are just a few years old? Yes. Yes, 2017. And I took some cuttings and dug up some of the, the uh, sprouts that were growing up around the base and that's what I'm going to put uh, to replace the final little bit of honeysuckle that still remains. So the one was from Missouri Wildflowers and then the second one was a Department of Conservation seedling. But they look a little different from each other, and I wonder, they were marked the same species. And I don't know what makes them look a little different, but they're both doing well. And you mentioned fragrant sumac, so yes, we see that over here. Red so this was probably a fall of 2016. It was one of our original native plant purchases. It was just a little a few inches tall at the time and it's grown and it flowered this spring. Uh, there's another ghost beard over here. We have red buds that we are just allowing um, several of them to stay. We put a button bush back there. Again, I didn't know how well it would do with not much sun and we had to make a point to keep it watered, but it has bloomed the last couple summers. <clears throat> This was an area originally that was just buried in uh, weedy, weedy, uh, weedy plants. And the bush honeysuckle. The bush honeysuckle, uh, bone set. Well, bone set is uh, kind of a good plant. And this yeah. is golden ragwort. Um, it has real pretty, I don't know, a couple feet tall yellow Stock, flower stalks that are loaded with little yellow flowers. So this is Pacara aurea? Yes. Because it's the Obama of the Obama, it's the Squawi, right? Another ground cover for you. Yes, yes. And it, it must like our yard because it does spread. We have we put it in several places. Uh, palm sedge. We tried some of those there. I think those were freebies from Wild Ones gatherings. People gave them away. A little spice bush I just planted this spring. It doesn't look as nice in the fall, but in the spring, uh, when it's actively growing, uh, it's really, really an attractive plant. Because yeah. it comes up so early. Well, this is fairly a fairly new planting, so it hasn't filled in as much as the one over there. And you mentioned violets, and we see uh, oh, yes. a nice little <clears throat> clump of violets in here. We always like to point out the violets uh, to our well, landowners since they're a volunteer yes. plants you don't need to go buy anywhere, and yet they're native and they're good wildlife plants. And then Solandine <coughs> poppy uh, blooms profusely in the spring as, as well as there's bluebells, Virginia bluebells in this area that they bloom at the same time so they look really pretty together. So we tried some zigzag goldenrod here that is, likes shade and it does send up a flower stalk in the late summer and will bloom yellow flowers. It kind of makes a nice little ground cover too while it's small. Well, excellent, excellent. Uh, real nice assortment in a, in a very shady space, and you've really got the diversity going here. It looks like we have some downy skullcap here. Yes, uh, we planted these three plants in 2016, probably toward the fall. 
and they've come up ever since and gotten a lot bigger. They also seed themselves and they don't mind being uh, divided and transplanted. So this is fairly shady here. It gets dappled sunlight. I don't think it really might get a tiny bit of direct sun, but we have moved them other places. There's some in front that get pretty much six hours of direct sun and they've done well. Uh, there's more and some more shady spaces, so we're pretty happy with it. How about moisture level? Uh, I would say, for the most part, it's medium moisture. Um, Average to dry? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then it does attract a lot of bees and butterflies. And it looks nice with this red cardinal flower that blooms at the same time. I really like it. it. It's a pretty color and it's easy to move around and put other places. Well, Ed and Susan, uh, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time with us today and sharing your landscape. Uh, we learned a lot. Uh, we had a good time. Uh, uh, any uh, sort of parting comments or tips or words of wisdom you'd like to share? There's a lot of uh, good information on, on the internet. so. Uh, if you have a question, Google it. Uh, join an organization like Wild Ones. There's many others around in addition to them. Uh, Missouri Wildflower Nurseries Catalog is a great source of information. Um, you know, as you walk around, if you see plants that you like, figure out what it is. Uh, you know, and visit the local nurseries. Yeah, the no local nurseries uh, have a lot of native plants now. We, we've gone to Garden Heights and uh, uh, Sugar Creek Gardens, but there's others, Rolling Ridge and Greenscape Gardens and River City Natives, they do native plants. Uh, I also took a lot of courses through the St. Louis Community College system in 2018 when we first got started. Uh, we can't do that anymore because of the pandemic, but there's a lot of resources online, webinars, things like that where you can learn. Um, when we started, we didn't really know what we were doing. We just got the bug when we removed the honeysuckle, and I took the classes, and then we just bought little plants. We didn't know what would do well in our yard, so we bought a lot of different little plants, tried them out, and then gradually introduced more as we saw what did well in the yard. And sometimes moving a plant 20, 30 feet makes all the difference in the world. And they move pretty well, most of them, if you do it at the right time. Or if, even if you don't, they survive most of the time. Uh, we did start a little bigger than maybe was recommended. I always hear, start small, don't overwhelm yourself, which is a good point. Uh, we did clear out a lot of areas at once, and it's, it's been a lot to keep up with. But I think if you start small, it... it I mean, you can do it if you start big, because we have, but starting smaller, it, it, you don't get that overwhelmed feeling that we, I sometimes get. I don't think he gets it. But. Well, in my case, the mowing around individual trees was time consuming. If you extended the garden between two trees so you only had to do the perimeter, it was a lot easier to mow. Uh, so that was my motivation for connecting the garden between the trees uh, in kind of some logical manner. Very good. Well, again, uh, really, really appreciate you sharing your landscape with us today, and uh, thanks very much, and uh, uh, enjoy this uh, hot St. Louis summer. Yes, you too. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. It's been fun.